Good evening. Uh, Tonight's Bible reading comes from Psalm chapter 8. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. From the lips of children and infants you have ordained praise. Because of your enemies to silence and foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? You made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honour. You made him ruler over the works of your hands, you put everything under his feet, all flocks and herds and the beasts of the field, the birds of the air and the fish of the sea, all that swim the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. This is the word of the Lord. One of the things that I have done in the morning service, which I thought would be nice to do a little in the evening service, is that during school holidays, I've gone through Psalms, and uh, just as a break from our our regular series, I haven't done it so much in the evening services, um, so I thought it's probably time just to do a couple of Psalms in the evening service um, also, so that you get the benefit of some of those Psalms. I've probably done about half, almost half of the Psalms in the morning service since I've been here. Uh, That might mean I've been here too long, I don't know, but I've certainly done a lot of them. Um, and so this evening we're going to do a psalm that probably all of you know. Um, I suspect you know Psalm 23 and you know Psalm 8. Maybe one or two others you might know. Let's pray together and ask for God to help us. Our Father, we are deeply aware of our absolute dependence upon you. We fool ourselves into thinking that somehow we can understand your word without the help of of the Holy Spirit. We know that your word declares to us that spiritual things are spiritually discerned. And so if we are going to understand what you're saying to us and how it applies to our lives, we want to open ourselves up to the movement of the Spirit. And we pray that you would help us not to leave any stone unturned in the heart. Then we pray that you would help us to allow our minds to be informed by you. We pray that you would help us not to resist your work in us. And we ask this evening that you would burn your word upon our hearts and exalt the Lord Jesus Christ as you do that. And we pray for Jesus' sake. Amen. Six blind men approached an elephant. Each man put out his hand to touch some part of the elephant's anatomy though, as, and thought he had grasped the whole. To one, the elephant was like a tree. To another, like a wall. To a third, like a fan. To a fourth, like a snake. To a fifth, like a spear. And to a sixth, like a rope. Depending on where they touched the elephant, whether it was the leg, side, ear, trunk, tusk, or tail. The poem in which the fable is contained concludes that all of them were right, though each of them was wrong. It takes a synthesis of all aspects of God and his creation to get a complete picture of him. And none of us is so gifted as to be able to comprehend this, though we make some progress as we open our hearts and minds to the various facets of truth we encounter on our heavenly journey, like that elephant. There's some aspects of God we get a clearer picture than others. And if we only see one tiny little part of God and his creation, it might blur us into understanding greater things about God. For example, you have heard it said amongst those who do not have a relationship with God, how can you have a God of love when so many people got killed and A cyclone, an earthquake, September 9-11. But very rarely do we hear 
people crying out and saying in praise? Aren't we glad that God has gifted our medical faculty with such knowledge that they're able to produce a COVID-19 vaccine? And if we only focus on the one and not the other, we have a very distorted picture of who God is, not so. And what the psalmist tries to do as he hones us in and focuses us on creation is to try and give us a, a broad, a big picture of who God is. And in doing so, what we discover in this psalm is it is ultimately a revelation of God's glory. And it is, in a sense, almost defies belief, if I can put it like that, that humans can look at creation in all its vastness and conclude that we evolved from apes. It's bizarre. And when you look at the intricacy of the human being, and you see, for those of you who are parents, you know exactly what I'm talking about, and those of you who are yet to be parents, if you experience this one day, when you see the birth of a child, and the incredible intricacy in which a child has been put together, how can you doubt that there is a creator in this universe? And so when the psalmist lifts his eyes towards the heavens and he gazes out, the only response that seems to be fitting for the psalmist is to cry out, O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And he begins to speak about how God's glory is revealed in creation. Firstly, I want you to notice God's glory is revealed in nature. God's glory is revealed in nature. Verses 1 and 2 and verse 9. O Lord, our Lord, it should go, O Yahweh, our Lord, Yahweh Adonai, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Verse 9. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Now, the psalmist speaks about God's glory as it has been revealed in the heavens. Creation, though it has been marred by sin and scarred by our rebellion, and so Romans chapter 8, the Apostle Paul, as he writes to the Roman church, talks about how creation is groaning under the weight of sin, because creation is not in the same form it was when God first created the world. Some of the glory of creation has been lost. And we have a world now that is subject to pain, subject to suffering, so that it, it is waiting, in the words of Paul, as he speaks metaphorically in Romans, it's waiting for its liberation from the bondage under which it has been placed as a re result of our rebellion against God. But nevertheless, when we look at creation, there is still in creation, in spite of the fact that it's been marred, the glory of God that is revealed in the heavens and that which we see around us. Now, the, the Apostle Paul, when he writes to the Roman church in Romans chapter 1, speaks about how we have exchanged the glory of God for idols and how we have rejected the glory of God. And he talks about, as we look out into this creation, how we see certain dimensions of who God is, and yet we purposely deny those things about God. And he talks about the fact that you have to be blind and it is an act of volitional rebellion against God to deny what is obvious to the eye. When he uses that term, majestic, O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic, that little term in the original speaks about God's power. It speaks about God's law. It speaks about God's rule in creation. It speaks about God's might in judgment. And so when you trace the way that word is used throughout the Scriptures, all of those dimensions about God come out in that little word, majestic. 
and it speaks about the fact that God's power sustains the universe. It is because of God's grace that we continue to exist. Were God to withdraw entirely from the universe and take his presence away completely, the whole universe would collapse. We are sustained by Almighty God. He speaks about the term Lord that ascribes in the Old Testament uh, the kingship of God. Not only does God sustain creation, but God is the king over creation. All creation comes under his sovereignty, and he is free to act in creation and do with creation as he sees fit. He is not subject to how we think he should move. Psalm 97 verse 5 uses similar language, if I may read that quickly. The mountains melt like wax before Yahweh, before the Lord of all the earth. The mountains are as nothing, and if God chooses to move them or to do something to them, then he is entirely able to do that. Now, when we speak about God's revelation in creation, in theological terms, that is known as general revelation. General revelation gives us an understanding that there is a creator somewhere in this universe. The problem that general revelation cannot do is it cannot reveal the specifics about that creator. So, for example, let's say you grew up in South Africa as a bushman, and all you ever knew was the desert and you grew up in those circumstances, and you saw a lion kill a deer. What view of God would you have then? You might think there's a very cruel God who allows powerful animals to attack weaker animals and then eat them for dinner. And you may think, what kind of a God allows that to occur? So general revelation, though it points us to a creator, it does not tell us anything specific about that creator apart from his majesty that would lead us to a relationship with him. And so theologically, in order for us to get to the next level, God has revealed the Lord Jesus Christ, who is God's special revelation. And God's special revelation then teaches us about who God is and what God has done through the Lord Jesus Christ. And that, in turn, drives us to engage and enter into a relationship with God through Jesus. And without that special revelation, we wouldn't be able to enter into a relationship with God. And so those two dimensions work together. The general revelation is to point us in the direction of the fact that there is a God. It is, in effect, to cause us to seek after the Creator. Jesus then comes as the Creator, humbling Himself into this world, becoming one of us, so that we might get a clear, graphic picture of who God is and then enables us through his death on the cross to enter into a relationship with the God who is revealed in creation. Now, what's interesting about this psalm is he speaks about how you might get adults like Richard Dawkins, for example, who deny that there is a God, who is a militant atheist. And yet, such people like that says the author, are shamed by children. Because on the lips of infants, he has ordained praise. Isn't it interesting that God cuts across societal norms? We often admire the strong, successful, beautiful people in this world. God chooses to reveal himself through the weak things of this world, through the shameful things of this world. And so that Paul in 1 Corinthians 1 verse 27 makes this simple statement, but God 
chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. So you'll notice how the psalmist puts it uh, when he te- speaks about the children ordaining praise. Let me read it to you. Verse 2. From the lips of children and infants you have ordained praise. Because of your enemies to silence the foe and the agenda. In effect, what that verse is teaching us is that God takes those weak things, children who are dependent upon adults to keep them well and sustain them, who are not considered as strong because they are unable to defend themselves, and God causes them to praise Him when they, in fact, are adults who oppose Him and hate Him and rebel against Him. And so God through the praise of infants, shames those who are in rebellion to him. Now, the truth of the matter is, when you think about that, in Christian world, so we are told, statistically, now you can read statistics any way you want, and I know you can manipulate statistics to bring out any result you want, depending on how you frame your questions. Just watch Yes Minister for that. But the statistics seem to consistently reveal that most people come to faith as children. Isn't that interesting? That God takes the weak things of the world, children, and he enables them to come to faith and to praise him and to sing of him and to glorify him. The very ones who are symbolized by human weakness and humility ordained, are ordained to praise God. And so as we look and as we consider and we think about the universe, if you cannot see God there, you're as blind as a bat. If you cannot see a creator behind all of this, you're not looking properly. And if you're look at creation and somehow think that this universe appeared from nothing by a big bang when everything in our understanding says that explosive force doesn't create, it destroys. That somehow this incredible universe that is so precariously held in balance and a certain distance from the sun in order to be sustained comes into being by some fluke, then you're blind. Because creation points us to a creator. Secondly, God's glory is revealed in man. Look at this, verses 3 to 8. God's glory is revealed in man. When I consider your heavens and the work of your fingers, the moon, the stars, which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him? The son of man that you care for him. It's interesting. He uses two different phrases to talk about two different dimensions of human beings. You made him a little lower, and this, unfortunately, is not the best translation. If you've got an NIV... Under heavenly beings, you've got a little footnote there. And in the footnote, it says God. That word that is translated there, heavenly beings, is the word Elohim in the original. When the word Elohim is used in the original and used in Psalms, it is never, ever used of angels. It is always used of God. 
And so when it says you are created a little lower than heavenly beings, it should be you are created a little lower than God. In other words... The psalmist is saying that human beings do not have divine status. Only God has divine status. And human beings are different from God in that sense. We are lower than God. Our sustenance is dependent upon God. Were God to withdraw, we would die. He goes on. Let me keep reading and then we'll come back to some of this. You made him ruler over the works of your hands. You put everything under his feet, all flocks and herds and beasts of the field, birds of the air and fish of the sea, all that swim in the paths of the sea. Firstly, we see under God's glory revealed a man, his insignificance in verses 3 and 4. When the psalmist looks out in creation and he sees the vastness of the universe, he thinks in terms of what we are in comparison to the universe. Now, when you look into the stars, and apparently there are billions of them, and there are other universes that we can't see, and when you think of the vastness of space, and then you think of yourself in comparison to that, we are so tiny in terms of all that is out there. And the psalmist looks at this and he says, we are so insignificant, really, in the greatest scheme of things. We are as nothing. And yet, he concludes that in spite of man's insignificance, God has decided to care for him. And when we think about God's care, we must not simply reduce it to only God caring for Christians. That is to narrow down the care that God exists. And so, for example, in Matthew 5, verse 45, um, we are told in Scripture, uh, He causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Here's the irony. The very breath of those who hate God, is contingent, is dependent upon God's grace. And here they are, looking at God and shaking their fist in His face and denying Him or not submitting to Him or not bowing down to His Lordship, the very one who is enabling them to raise their fist in defiance against Him is the one who gives them breath. Isn't that incredible? What kind of grace is that? Because God, in His power and sovereignty, and in His judgments, could simply intervene in the affairs of humankind. And He could, had He so chosen, to obliterate the entire human race. And He would have been totally justified in that. Does that make you balk and become horrified? God is under no obligation to us. When Adam and Eve sinned against God, it's not as if God's hands were suddenly tied together and God was coerced to have to intervene and do something about the situation. God could have allowed humanity to perpetuate and continue from generation to generation without sending Jesus Christ into this world. And simply as people died, he could send them to an eternity in hell forever and he would have been totally justified in doing that. Completely. No one could have turned around to him and said, how can you do that? But he chose not to do that. He chose instead to intervene in the affairs of humankind. And he chose to come in the form of his son. This is the God of all glory. The God who holds creation in the palm of his hands. The God who sustains everything, gives it all up. And comes into the world as a human being. One of us made like us with flesh and bones, 
who suffers on our behalf, who is crucified by the ones he has come to save. That God cares for man. That God has shown how much he cares through the sending of the Lord Jesus Christ into this world. It is the supreme act of God's love and grace that God should intervene in the life of God-haters and come down, setting aside all that he ex enjoyed in fellowship with his Father in glory, to live in this dark, broken, dingy, hate-filled world that eventually nailed him to a cross and said, we don't have anything to do with you. How do you measure love and grace and care like that? It's impossible. But that's what he's done as a demonstration of how much he does care. And he continues to sustain Richard Dawkins in spite of Richard Dawkins' hate and denial of a God. And he continues to reach out in grace to Richard Dawkins and invites him to turn away from his denials and to find life in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's how much God cares for humanity who are so insignificant and unimportant. And you see, my dear friend, that may be you sitting here. I don't know. In a congregation of this amount of people, there may be one of you who is still living in defiance to God, in rebellion to Him, who has failed to acknowledge His Lordship over your life. And he reaches out to you and says, look at Jesus. I sent my son to save you. His glory is revealed in man in his insignificance and his dignity. Look at verse 5. You made him a little lower than God and crowned him with glory and honor. The phrase here in the NRV is a little bit, which we've dealt with mistranslated, but what I want you to see here is that man is not created as a divine being, but he is created with glory and honor. Why is the question we want to ask. What is it that causes God to say that we have been created in glory and honor? Well, the answer is not directly in the psalm. But it is in Genesis, for we are told in Genesis chapter 1 and 2 that we are created in the image of God, man and female, so that the image of God is found in both men and women. And it is the image of God that places honor and glory on us. It is why man has dignity. It is why, as believers, we will fight tooth and nail for the dignity of human beings because they are created in God's image. And being created in God's image, even though that image is scarred as a result of the fall and our rebellion, so even though that image has been affected by our rebellion against God, nevertheless, we are created by God in His image. What does that mean? It means that we are God's representation, uh, representatives in this world. It means God has given us moral di uh, dimension to our lives, even though our morals are corrupted by the fall. It means that we are able to uh, have fellowship with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. The animals cannot have fellowship with God. They do not have the ability to engage in a relationship with God as you and I. That's what separates us from the animals. It means that we have been created as those who are responsible for watching over, looking out creation, as he will say a, a little bit later in this psalm. It means 
that because the image of God has been created in us, or we are created in the image of God, that we need to treat each other as image bearers of God. And so there is dignity. There should be respect accorded to each other. That's why things like stealing is wrong. Because it hurts those whose goods are being stolen. It's why we fight for the right of an infant who has been created by God at conception in the womb of his mother or her mother. We fight for the dignity of that person because they are created at conception in the image of God and we don't have the right to put them to death through abortion. It's why murder is wrong. It is why God in Genesis 9, 6 says, a life for a life. If you murder someone, you are defying the image of God in them. And because you defy the image of God in them, you forfeit your own life. It is why we fight against discrimination. Because discrimination defies the image of God. God has created us equal at the foot of the cross. There is no better people and worse people in terms of their cultural background. And to discriminate against someone because they come from a different cultural background to us is to violate the image of God. To discriminate someone against because of their sex is to violate the image of God. It's why we fight against same-sex marriage. Because God has created us in His image to be husband and wife, to only function within marriage between a man and a woman, exclusively for life. And anything outside of that violates the image of God in man. It's why we fight against mass murder, the Holocaust. Because to take weak and vulnerable people and put them to death for no other reason than they Jews violates God's image in man. It's why we fight against sex slavery that is happening throughout the world. It's why we fight against child pedophilia abuse. It's why we fight against euthanasia. Because you are destroying the image of God. We don't have the right to take life. Only God has the right to take life. And so we can multiply out. why we believe you have dignity as human beings because God's image is imprinted upon you. Now let me tell you, if you haven't worked this out, that is the difference between the evolutionist and the Christian. They've got no basis on which to have any kind of moral compass, none whatsoever, because it's the fittest that survive. And Dawkins, as an evolutionist, recognizes that. At least he's courageous enough to admit that. Because morality now becomes determined by the community that you're in. Whatever they consider to be right and wrong. And we know how that changes so rapidly. But when you have a God who's revealed himself, in his son, and a God who has shown us what is right and wrong in his word, and a God who's imprinted these values upon our heart so that our consciences condemn us when we go and rail against God. Then you have an objective basis 
then you have a different means by which you can evaluate right and wrong altogether. And so we uphold the dignity of human beings because the image of God has been created in them. They have honor and glory. Thirdly, his function, verses 6 to 8. Now, it's, my, it's quite clear here, verses 6 to 8. You made him ruler of the works of your hands. You put everything under his feet, all flocks and herds and beasts of the field and birds of the air and fish of the sea and all the parts of the sea. Now, what, again, this speaks to, and I don't want to get misunderstood yet because it's very easy to get misunderstood in today's world, that we have been created as those who are responsible for the management of the created world that God has created. In other words, we will be held accountable to God for how we have used the resources that God has given us in this world. And so we can't just treat the world in a way that abuses its resources. We can't just use and deplete resources that God has given us in this world because we have a responsibility for Him to manage those in a way that is wise. And so there is a sense in which we should be concerned about our creation. We should be concerned about forests being cut down, animals going extinct because of some of the devastation that, that is occurring. We should be concerned about the well-being of this world, but not to the point where that in itself becomes an idol or a god. Because what can easily happen in Romans 1, it talks about how we take creation and we make creation into a God. And now creation becomes the God who we bow down to and serve. And creation becomes more important than the Creator. Now, for example, it's not in Australia, thank goodness, but in California, dolphins have been granted citizenship. A dolphin has citizenship rights. Now, how crazy is that? God has created us as human beings to manage, to watch over, to look after creation. Not for creation to be given the same status as human beings. That's a violation of God's mandate to us. That's putting creation and giving it a status that God doesn't give it. And so we need to be careful that we don't turn looking after the planet into another idol that we bow down and worship. While at the same time, we need to be wise in how we use the resources that God has given us in this world. For to him we will give an account. Thirdly, God's creation, uh, God's glory is revealed in Christ. God's glory is revealed in Christ. Verses 5 to 8. Now what I want to try and bring out of this is you say, well, how on earth does that reveal or Christ. Well, it points us, it is prophetic as well, and you mustn't miss this in the psalm, it points us to the Lord Jesus Christ, because rightly understood, this psalm is messianic. Unfortunately, due to the fall of mankind, what happened at the fall? Apart from us being plagued by sin, we lost dominion over creation. There was a sense in which our, our humanity was deeply affected. Strife entered into the world. The first argument between Adam and Eve began. 
and they started blaming one another and blaming the serpent for the sin that they'd committed. Creation was disrupted. The whole world was plunged into sin, and creation, as a result of that, has been slowly but surely over that time decaying and groaning and slowly getting worse and worse to the point in which God will intervene at some point in the future, and He will wrap up history before the creation falls apart. If the creation were left to its end point, it would ultimately destroy itself. And we'd have nothing left, no matter what we did, because sin affected everything. It had a global effect. And we see creation slowly but surely breaking down. You know what it's like? You buy something brand new, like a car, if you can afford that, or a new phone. Now, you can all afford that. You buy a brand new phone. What happens after one month? It's no longer new. What happens after one year? You're looking at the upgrade. What happens after two years? You leave it somewhere in the hope that it gets stolen so you can go and get the upgrade and claim on insurance. But it gets old, doesn't it? And it breaks down. And it loses its luster. It loses its splendor. Everything does. My wife keeps throwing away shirts because she says they've got holes in them. And I keep saying, it's only 25 years old. Just, just take the foot off the accelerator at the moment, you know. I, I can still wear this. And my jeans have come into fashion because they've got holes in them now. But mine are genuine. Everything breaks down. And then comes Jesus. And what does Jesus do that you and I cannot do? And what will he yet do? He comes as a human being who is perfect. And he reveals to us what we lost. And he shows us what we will become, those who are in Christ. And he lives as a perfect human being. And through his death, he conquers death. And through his resurrection, he has victory over death. And through his ascension, he goes to live with God. And all things are made subject to the Lord Jesus Christ, who now rules over creation. And one day he will return, and he will restore creation. And we will have a new heavens and a new earth and new bodies that will never decay, because Jesus Christ does what you and I could never do. And so this is quoted in Hebrews chapter 2, verses 7 to 9. Let me read it because you think I'm making this up. Hebrews 2, 7 to 9. Speaking of Jesus, listen carefully. You made him a little lower than the angels. Does that sound right? You crowned him with glory and honor and put everything under his feet. In putting everything under him, God left nothing that is not subject to him. Yet, at present, we do not see everything subject to him, but we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels, now crowned with glory and honor, because he suffered death so that by the grace of God he may taste death for everyone. Do you see that the, the, the author to the Hebrews picks up on this? He interprets it a little bit differently to it in its original context, but he picks it up in terms of Jesus Christ coming into this creation and, and, and giving, setting aside his glory in heaven and coming and subjecting himself to man and coming under the authority of God and living in obedience and submission to the Father so that every point in the life of Jesus, he demonstrates to us what it means to live in total total surrender to God. At every point, he obeys God. At every point, he shows the love for the Father by submitting to the will of God the Father. And so, eventually, as the perfect man, he is able to go and die on behalf of humanity, taking upon himself sin, tasting death. Can you believe that? This is the God of all creation. This is the God who gives life, who breathes life into us. Taste death. 
so that you and I might experience victory over death. So that you and I might experience new life in Him. So that you and I might taste resurrection life. So that you and I might go to be in glory with Him one day. Dying, paying, suffering on the cross for our rebellion. Living amongst us. Experiencing all we experience. Suffering so, suffering so cruelly on that cross. Thus as a result of His humiliation. Read uh, Philippians chapter 2. To see the humiliation of Christ. Because of his humiliation, coming down, humbling himself, being humiliated at the hands of men, willingly, willingly putting himself on the cross. For Jesus himself articulates and says, I could have called on 10,000 angels to rescue me from the cross, but doesn't. so that you and I might be restored to our true humanity, so that you and I might be reconciled to God the Father through Christ, so that we might be created into new people, a new humanity. See, that's what God does with the church. He creates a new people for himself, a new humanity, a restored humanity, a humanity that has now been given life and breathed spiritual life into through the Lord Jesus Christ by the power of the Spirit. And he takes people who are created in death, who are old and dying, and he kills them. And he creates in their place new people, restored who one day will live with him forever. That's the miracle of the Messiah. That he takes people who are bound over to darkness and are lost in their sin and he releases them from captivity by taking upon himself their sin, dying in their place, suffering their shame. And as a result, God not only raises him from the dead, but God exalts him and puts him at his right hand, the position of exaltation, and the reason Jesus sits at the right hand of God is not because Jesus is tired. It's because it is symbolic, metaphorical of the fact that Jesus' work on the cross is finished. And then, as a result of his ascension and as a result of his exaltation, there's a day coming set in the future that God has determined according to his sovereignty when Jesus Christ will return and this time as a king. And he will take that new humanity he has created that has resurrection life. And they will go to live with him in his new creation forever because of his work on the cross. <laughs> what a savior. You know, there's an interesting story, and I'll close with this. There's an interesting story about Queen Elizabeth II that you may or may not know. When she was at, uh, still uh, at, at 17, I think, her, she was born in 1926, if I remember correctly. When the Second World War started, she wanted to help out in the war effort. And so she went to her father and said, do you mind, I'd, 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 to the king, I'd, I'd like to help out. And so they assigned her to a, let me just get this right, I don't want to misquote, they allowed her to join the armed forces and serve in Britain in the auxiliary tutorial service as a private. Did you know that? She served as a private. And there was a particular sergeant who, who was over her that, that made life very difficult for her and kept abusing his authority When's a private do this? When's a private do that? 
and ordered her around, as sometimes sergeants are prone to do to privates. And then her father died in 1952. And the private, who was ordered around by a sergeant, became queen. I wonder how he felt. Never again would he ever be able to say to her, Private Windsor, do this. Now she was queen. Now she had authority invested in her as the queen. Never again, never again will people spit in the face of Jesus. Never again will they mock him. Never again will they ridicule him when he comes again. Or they may do it now in the intervening period. But when Jesus returns, make no mistake, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So my question is, have you confessed him as Lord? Because you will either do it now or you will do it in eternity, but you will do it. As sure as the sun rises every day and sets every day, Jesus Christ will come back. And if you have confessed him at Lord, and you have bowed before him, then can I encourage you to proclaim his name? Because there are lots of people out there who haven't, and they need to hear about the Savior, this glorious God. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Amen. Our Father, what a glorious psalm. You are so great and so powerful and so mighty. You rule the universe. Nothing is too difficult for you. No plan of yours can be thwarted. You are not frustrated in any sense. You will accomplish everything you have set out to accomplish. All your purposes will prevail. And when finally every single last purpose has been fulfilled, Jesus will return. How we long for that day. And I want to pray that for any here who have yet to confess you as Lord, that you would draw them to yourself. And those who do know you, may you cause them daily to burst forth in praise and to tell the world that there is a Savior who saves. Pray this for Jesus' sake.